Scratch Space is a virtual forum hosted by the Lucas Artist Residency Program, Montalvo Arts Center. And over the next few months, we'll be bringing together visual artists, scholars, composers, activists, and writers to explore what kind of radical imaginaries can unfold in this moment of pandemic, racial reckoning, economic uncertainty, and environmental crisis. So we're interested in how do we think about what's possible? How can we use our imaginations to build a better present and future? And how can we retool and create better and more equitable models for living and working together? So um, who are we going to be speaking with today, Kelly? <laughs> well, I'm really looking forward to today. There was a time this summer when you were away from me, Donna, and I'm thrilled to have you here with me today, that I thought I need to bring Nicholas, Carl, and Karen together to speak about the book they created. Today we'll be speaking with Carl R. Pope, an interdisciplinary, conceptually based artist from Indianapolis who's committed to the idea of art as a catalyst <clears throat> for individual and collective transformation. Joining us is Nicholas Mirzoff, a visual activist working at the intersection of politics, race, and global visual culture based in New York City, where he serves as professor of media, culture, and communication at NYU. And Karen R. Pope, who I had the pleasure of meeting just now, poet and writer and installation artist, along with her brother and her twin, Carl Pope, also based in Indianapolis. Together, we're going to be talking about the work they created in 2018, which is a book entitled The Appearances of Black Lives Matter. The book is based off a, a writing by Nicholas Mirzoff, which was written in 2017. We're also gonna explore the importance of collaboration in reshaping how we engage with the world and one another. Well, that sounds amazing. Um, and links to our guest full bios have been posted in the chat, along with a PDF version of the book, The Appearance of Black Lives Matter. There's a lot to talk about. Um, I'm going to be disappearing shortly and Kelly, Carl, Nick and Karen will chat for about 50 minutes and then I'll return to field questions from you, our audience. So please post your questions and comments in the chat. Um, so we're going to be bringing Carl, Karen and Nicholas into the conversation um, and I'm going to be disappearing. So thank you, Kelly, and I will see you soon. Thank you, Donna. So, Mr. Pope, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm glad to be here. I'm thrilled to have you. Hi, Karen, how are you? Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Great. And Nick, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Very nice to be here with you all. It's a treat to have you. You know, asking how you are in this moment is a little loaded, but we're just going to dive in. <laughs> the best way for us to start would be the way that, that the book version of The Appearance of Black Lives Matter um, starts, and that's with a poem by Karen entitled, I Occupy Space. I'm going to turn it to you, Karen. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. I occupy a space which has no respite from a white hot gay, most oft, never relenting, never forgiving, never relinquishing critique upon movement of my being. So I languish under that perpetual strain and we too die under the weight of that same gaze, come rain, come shine, in places and spaces, co-opted, segregated, authored unto legislative abjection, which cries out with the most basic of utterance, Black Lives Matter, which cries out with the most basic of utterance, hands up, don't shoot, which cries out with the most basic of utterance, say her name. Oral testaments of pain, sorrows, and rebukes, shared traumas that we are conditioned to relive. 
sanction snuff films on a continuous loop. And yet again, empathy is deferred as we are met with cognitive dissonance, met with solipsism, met with contempt, harbingers of intention violence, subtle and overt, unleashed upon our unshaded hues, our psyches, our humanities. Thus, my will, my character is honed and polished by causality. I have evolved to be unrepentant within the space which I occupy. I stand my ground and on the shoulders of the fallen, and I invoke my right to look, and I invoke my right to question, and I invoke my right to know, forced outwardly in the direction of all seated oppressors and order followers, and I am unbowed. So I lay claim to my place within a collective ray of consciousness, alongside the unapologetic who dare channel past history while illuminating the future of life affirming social practice, performance art. Stream from sidewalks, stream from cars, stream from windows. Realized change reverberates loud. Realized change reverberates aloud. Realized change reverber reverberates aloud. Revolution. Thank you, Karen. So this poem is the opening point for the book. The book, which is based on a text that Nicholas Mirzoff wrote in 2017. And Nick, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions just about the writing of the text. Um, and my first question, I just want to kind of place you in this American tapestry, if I can, and I'd like to ask you just a little bit about your own personal background and kind of your arrival to the States. Sure. Let me just, before we begin, I just want to pay tribute to Karen's reading there. Thank you. It was so beautiful. Great. And um, to hear your voice say those words, which I'm very familiar with, just adds that extra dimension to it. And to see you live them in that way is very, very moving in, in a very difficult time. So thank you, Karen. You're welcome, Nick. And, um, you know, I, this transports me back to when I actually wrote that. And we are still in the same place emotionally and physically and spiritually with what's going on all around us. So whenever I read this, I am still touched. It's still raw, and it'll probably be raw for the remainder of my life unless things drastically change. Yeah, let's hope not. I mean, it only goes to the question that Kelly asked me too, which is, you know, I mean, I came to this country from the UK, and in Britain, my position is odd. I mean, I when, I'm conf when a police sees me, I'm not Black British. Mm. But when I'm in a conversation with an English person, a Boris Johnson type, the first thing they'll say to me is, that's not an English name, is it? So, which it isn't, it's true. It's a Central Asian name, they know that. Um, and if you have a name like mine with all the I's and the R's and the Z's and all that, um, that's not an English name, they know that. But when you get here, when I got here, and it took me a while to realize this, but it's very clear to me now, you know, what for all the complexity of my own personal background, Central Asian, Jewish, all this, uh, I'm white. I'm white here. And that took me a while to fully appreciate what the, the depth of what that meant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this project and the, and the work that I'm doing now, and I will hopefully do continue to do for some time, because as Karen just rightly said, this is the work of 400 years, and uh, it's unlikely to be undone by any of us in this space now. Uh, it becomes then a redefining of how one does the work, you know, and what that work is, um, for whom it is, 
for how, how one does it. All of those questions went into making this project and to continuing to make the work that I'm trying to do. Nicholas, will you speak just a little bit about how you came to, to writing this text? Yeah, now this is important because obviously we think back to 2014 with the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement at that time. And I remember it had been launched following the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012. And, you know, I remember it was a day much like today in New York, very hot and humid. And I'm sitting in my kitchen on a computer, much like I'm doing right now. And suddenly this news erupted all over social media. What has happened to Michael Brown and his murder? And I stayed in that space for about 12 hours, just watching what, what was happening. And I realized two things at once. One is that this was going to be the defining issue for the field that I worked in, which was, and is this question of the place of visual culture in defining our, our culture as a whole. But also there was a call to me, you know, there was a call to me as an activist. And that call was very simple, which was to follow not to lead, right? To be to be where I needed to be and to be at the back of the march. And I did that a lot in New York and then later in Los Angeles when I was there until the press conference that was given by attorney Michael, uh, Darren McCulloch, I think his name was, um, referring to the question of the failure to indict Darren Wilson for the murder of Michael Brown. And during that press conference, he smoked and he laughed. And one of the things that he said was, I'm going to release all the grand jury materials because I'm so convinced that you'll find him innocent, him, Darren Wilson. And this is extraordinary because grand jury materials are normally secret. And I went to look at these and I thought, this is something I can do, you know, because here is a bunch of photographs, there's about 300 photographs, there are video clips, there are sound clips, and there's 40,000 words of text. In other words, it's an archive. And this is the work that I do. And I thought what I would do would be to write something about the photographs. But then when I looked at the photographs, they tell you almost nothing. Mm -hmm. So then I started to read the text. And within the first page of the grand jury deposition, you know that something is up. Something very unsavory is going on. Something very similar to the fake jury trials of the civil rights period and so on. And I realized that this was then something that, because activists were out in Ferguson every night, confronting the forces of repression, this was something I could legitimately do, was to read this material and say, what's going on here? And at that time, there was a magazine called Tidal, which came out of Occupy Wall Street. It was online, uh, it no longer exists. And I used to write for them. And I wrote a piece um, in about a week, reading all of this material that prov provided a different account of what happened to Michael Brown. And it was called One Minute of White Supremacy. And the reason it was called that was one of the first things that I figured out was that the whole incident, everything that happened between Michael Brown and Darren Wilson took about 50 seconds from when Wilson pulled up his vehicle to when he shot Michael Brown to death. And this, you know, was astonishing to me to realize that that could, so, so tragic and terrible event could unfold in so little time. So we posted this piece and, you know, Occupy Wall Street reached a lot of people and about 100,000 people looked at this thing within the first day. And it took on a life of its own and people started to ask me to give talks and to, to participate in events and so on. And let's be specific here because we should be specific. It was mostly white, academics and administrators inviting me to give talks to predominantly white audiences, essentially mediating, essentially explaining the movement, the issues. And so I started to feel that I, mean, I had had this material and I felt that there was a potential book here, but I was very, well, I wanted to be really cautious about how to do this because one thing that was really clear to me was that I couldn't try and make a kind of a claim to this work because Black Lives Matter isn't for people who are identified or identifying as white. We need to learn from it. We need to participate in how, in the undoing of white supremacy. But in the book, I define the work that I was trying to do as if there is an anti-blackness in our society, which I think now is palpably clear. And it's in fact, 
the so-called president of the United States has now made this federal policy that it, anti-racism is anti-American, therefore racism is American. So what was my position? My position was not to speak for African-Americans or people of African descent because they're entirely capable of doing that for themselves, but to speak for what I called anti-anti-blackness, which was to say, we need to understand people identified or identifying as white, how much we have benefited, like it or not, whether we choose to, in any active way, from the structuring anti-blackness of contemporary US society and take a position, an active position, not a just, well, of course, I don't agree with that, but an active position that involves forms of action, depending on whatever capacities we have, that are against that anti-blackness. And so this book was a collaborative and open sourced attempt to do a small part together with friends and comrades to contribute to that project. And um, it was, uh, was and remains, I think, an example of what one can do if you set yourself outside the traditional disciplinary or academic or career trajectories that are, are held out to us as the way you ought to do things. We didn't do any of that. And I am very grateful to Karen and Carl for being open to participate in that way. Uh, and it's now taking on a new life. And uh, that's so exciting to me. I'm gonna move on to Carl. I have other questions, but I want, I want to ask you, Carl, I know you and Nicholas had a long kind of collegial association with each other and friendship. And when, when Nicholas came to you and asked for your participation in this book as a collaborator, you know, how did you receive it? What, what did it mean to you? Wow. Um, first of all, I got really excited. Uh, it was the second time we had worked together on a project. He came to Cleveland to speak on a, about a public project, a billboard project that I did in Cleveland. And then uh, 10 years later, he sends me an email and says that I he wants me to participate. So what the thing that's the most interesting part about this um, this invitation was that it was an opportunity for me to bridge the work that I did about police brutality and bridge the the poster installation that I, I had been working on for several years to bring a, a, a whole lot of projects and interests uh, together or to connect them in a way that I had not even thought of. And it, it, as well as uh, actually uh, advancing uh, the kind of ideas that I have, have with my twin sister, because, you know, we had talked about uh, us continuing to do uh, text-based work, but finding different kinds of ways outside the, the conventional ways of like working with text. And so uh, the ideal of like having these three voices interact and um, uh, uh, speak to each other through the book was, uh, was the outgrowth of like uh, our collaboration, so. It's, it's really great. I'm curious if you actually took Nick's text or if you started with your own kind of interpretation off of the title, if you read through what he'd written and, and how you decided to pull, because many of the, the works, the text-based works within the book are from the Bad Air Smells of Roses poster project, correct? Okay, so the, uh, in the book, it's a, an iteration of the Bad Air Air project and what what's so interesting for me was to actually read uh, borrow text from Nicholas's uh, other books 
and ideas that I felt that uh, uh, ro uh, uh, rotated around or orbited around uh, the, the, the issues of, of police brutality to fashion a, a, a text just for the book. So like the poster project is just sort of this random like expansive mapping of blackness, but the bad air smells of roses in terms of the book iteration of it was a sort of focus on um, those issues that uh, was brought up by Nicholas in his, in his, in his book. And you can, I mean, I see that as I go through the book and I shared this image with you, but I want to just share it because it was this image I kept coming back to as I tried to wrap my head just around all of this, including my own kind of state of being um, in this moment. But I thought you, Carl, might want to speak to this a little bit because this would be close to the introduction of the book. I think it's following Nick's um, preface of the book and how he came to the writing of the book. And then there's this beautiful, am I literate enough to make sense of what I now see? And certainly that resonates with me in this moment. I mean, this is, you know, this is, we're taking in a lot of information right now and, and trying to process through and how we navigate. It, exactly. And it speaks to both the issue of police brutality and Black Lives Matter, Black, Black Lives Matter, but also about Nicholas's work and specifically the book, um, how to see the world because i think for me reading that book he spoke about like the need to be more literate about what is going on in contemporary society and he, he brings up significant examples and ways in which uh we can navigate uh with a comprehension of what is uh now unfolding in uh, con uh, contemporary society. And so I, uh, just to unpack, uh, quickly unpack this, this is what my intention was in, in uh, adding this particular, this particular uh, passage. Yeah. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, so Karen, I wanna join Nicholas in just thanking you. I mean, it's clear that that poem sort of still sits so, so raw and, and continues to and was so moving. You had sort of turned me to a radio interview you, done, you did and hearing you read that poem there was really, you know, the same kind of passion in your voice and, and it's a lived experience. Yes. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Tell me when, when Carl turned to you, I know the two of you have collaborated now for quite a long time, but when he turned to you with this idea of writing a book, how did you how did you receive it? Oh, I was excited, but um, I didn't have any work already prepared, so I wasn't sure that I would be able to relax enough to let it come up and out. The way I work is so organic, but then I did feel a sense of pressure, so. I accepted and I just, uh, at that time, Nick did have the uh, uh, book online, the PDF. So I decided to start with that. And Nick, I have to say this, I only made it to page 20. And <laughs> it that was enough, that was enough for me, along with all the images that I ha had seen on Facebook and on the news with all the brutality and and all the facts that were coming out about the people who had been brutalized and killed, that was enough for me to energize me to begin the process of me pulling the words and all the emotions out and put them on paper. So uh, I'm really amazed at the words that came up and out, but it's all about the, my lived experience. And I think, and hopefully it's clear that I was able to channel 
past conversations with Carl and things that I had known about Nick and the things that Nick had written in the PDF that was online. So, yes. Yeah. Um, Nick, how, how did you sort of, as, as you watched Carl and Karen work with the text, what was that, you know, can we go back to that experience? And then I think I'd like just between the three of you, you know, this idea of collaboration, what can happen in this space when you turn over an idea to somebody and allow them to sort of take, take and shape it? What happens in that space? And what are the possibilities of, of that kind of work? That's a very rich question. There's a lot to say. Um, let's say that, I mean, at first I, I want to say that when you have a movement like Black Lives Matter, it's a dialogical movement, right? It's when you make a statement, Black Lives Matter, that's to a person who is of African descent, that's an affirmative statement. That's simply, that's an affirmative, that that person has the same full right to human status as any, as any other person. But to a person identified or identifying as white, it's also a question, isn't it? It's a question of, do Black Lives Matter fully matter to you? And we have seen, you know, at the, both at the time that the book was published and especially since, a wide range of people in this country answer that question, no. So it doesn't surprise me that Karen didn't need to read much of this book in order to get the sense of what it is, because this is her lived experience every day. Every day she walks out in the street. And that was part of what I wanted to get at with this book was because my audience, to be honest, um, is primarily an audience that is identifying or identified as white. And I wanted people to realize and to think through the experiences that people like Carl and Karen face every single day. And I'd seen this with Carl when he was my colleague in Stony Brook, that my experience of Stony Brook and his were very different in the same sorts of spaces. It wasn't, you know, that we were going different places in the same spaces. So the part of what I, what I felt was that this project would come to fruition when it became a polylogue, if you like. It's more than a dialogue because there's more than two voices involved here. There were many voices and, and Carl channels many voices in his section. Karen channels many voices in her poem and I tried to speak as widely as I could in terms of the critical work that I was doing. And to me, it wasn't until that book came into physical being that the project really existed. Once it did, it took on a kind of life um, because it's a conversation. And it's a, a conversation that this country finds tremendously hard to have conversation across the color line yeah. and you know there's lots of conversation on either side of course and those conversations can be tremendously important but one of the things that someone like claudia rankine who's a poet i think in the in the manner of karen actually um has reached out to white folks and said you can't look away from this you can't look away from what's going on here what does that actually mean? I think what, what she's saying to us is you've got to learn how to have these kinds of conversations. As difficult as it may be, and as, you know, as, as many assumptions as you're going to have to challenge for yourself, and you're going to have to realize some not tremendously palatable things about yourself some of the time. And that's, you know, and that's not, I'm not saying anything that's not true for myself. I'm saying that from my own experience. So I felt like this is a this was the way that the project needed to be in order for it to justify its own existence. There's no point in me writing a project about this movement by myself. Until or unless it was in proper dialogue and polylogue with people whose experience it was attempting to not represent, but to to articulate or to make intelligible to an audience that have for too long just assumed that they knew or assumed that they understood or assumed that these issues were in the past. So all of those things came, came I think, into it. And 
I think it was also, you know, as Carl said, I got cut off briefly, so I missed some of what Carl said. Um, the computer did, decided to throw me off. Um, but it was a way for us to really re-engage our dialogue in a way that continues and found a variety of outlets. We did an exhibition together. We're doing this poster project now because there's a kind of energy. And this is part of it, partly it's the energy of the movement, but it's also the energy of the collaboration that it's not done, you know? And I, I think, you know, when you when a project is done, you know, you, you walk away from it. This one is not done by any manner of means. And uh, now it's very much the leadership of Carl and Karen that's moving this project forward. And that's a, as it should be. Uh, and it's exciting to see where they're taking it. Maybe this is the moment for Karen, you to talk about your most recent experience with the project. You know, this was only two years ago that the book was written. And, you know, sometimes in the world we live in, especially the world I live in, was three years ago? Yes. You're muted. 2017. Okay, so the book was written in 2017. The collaboration happened 2018. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the hardcover, this this actual version I've been, you know, stewing over <laughs> was created in 2018, a limited edition um, collaboration. And so now it's, you know, it continues to take on a life. For me, I guess the point is, you know, this pandemic has made time feel so collapsed and so expanded at the same time. And it's starting to feel like this history of this country, we're also able to have this expansion and collapse, looking at our own history, looking at kind of my position in this country, possibly your position, you know, and how we need to, this narrative needs to change and the story needs to, the stories need to change. The stories need to be clear. That kind of longing for a deeper understanding of history when I was a young person and couldn't find anything to grasp onto, I know now what was missing. Oh, wow. You know, I know now what part of the story I needed to hear, I wanted to hear, I wanted to understand. And I never could point to edit. And I'm old, you know, to be 50 and to be sort of coming to this moment is really something. So... This, this collaboration between the three of you is really pretty powerful. And I, you know, loved hearing the story of sort of this most recent iteration and maybe Karen, you'll share that. Oh, um, I think it's, it was in June. Uh, I'm on Instagram and uh, Lisa Martin, the curator owner of the Women's Dark Room reached out to me wanting to uh, post the poem from the book. And uh, we talked and she posted the poem. She did an awesome job. And it was so well received. I think a week into it, she, she uh, messaged me again and said, hey, the book comes with two posters. What do you think it, about the idea of me uh, taking the posters and uh, disseminating them throughout Manhattan? And then I have friends throughout the United States in Japan and in Europe sending the posters out to them, asking them to post. And once they post, to take pictures, and we'll just go from there. And that gave the book and the project a whole other life. So you have an image and images of Margate. Her friend Jane Howard uh, posted those. And Margate has a, a history of fierce racism. So that was really apropos for the posters to be posted there. Uh, Minneapolis, California, we're waiting for, for pictures from Japan. So uh, I have to thank Lisa because it was her genius to think of putting the posters out for, for people to also learn about the book and the project, Nicholas's work and Carl's work. So I, I have to clap for that. that was pure genius and we're still working together so it's not over i just love that the book has just taken on a new life i'm going to pull up some of the images you referred to and i'm actually going to start in in vermont um 
And let me see if I can make this happen for us. And we don't want to see all of that because it gives our story away. Um, so I'm going to start here. And I picked this image and we picked it internally at Montalvo because we sit in 175 acres and we're constantly looking at our forest and trying to understand that space. So the decision for one of these works to be hung in this forest, um, I thought was really pretty incredible. Um, this is in Vermont. And N Nick, I think it's, for me, this idea of appearances, and then you also speaking of, of non-appearance, and maybe you just speak a little bit about that. Um, that's, a, that's just a very rich moment to bring that idea in, I think. So I brought this idea of appearance from political theory. There's a way that political theory says that politics happens where people appear to each other. And what they don't really think about is who those people are. Mm -hmm. So the example that's usually used is the ancient Greek city like Athens or something. But the trouble with that idea is you exclude all women, all the enslaved people, which was the overwhelming majority of the Athenian population, people under 18 and non-Greeks. So by the time you got through with all of that, you really got 4% of the Athenian population who were allowed to appear. So when we talk about democracy, we talk about it being modeled on ancient Greece, we should be very aware of what that really means. So I started to think in terms of well, what, what does this mean in terms of the United States? And I started to think about the ways in which many of these murders that we were seeing were taking place in spaces that were not normally central to media representation or to our consciousness of the United States as it's normally displayed by media and other formats. In parts of the countryside where Sandra Bland was pulled over or in the suburbs of Minneapolis where Philando Castile was pulled over or in a park in Cleveland where Tamir Rice was shot and killed and so many of these examples. And I started to think of this as the space then of non-appearance, the space that's outside of the, the very constrained and limited realm in which action is allowed and authorized. And what I think is so striking about these poster projects is that I don't really need to do that argument. I think it makes it visual here that these are claiming that space of non-appearance. I mean, you know, by going into somewhere like a forest in Vermont, which is, you know, this is the pines and the woods and the mountains and all of that is a kind of visual backdrop for white supremacy. It doesn't have to be, but it just is. And by putting Carl's poster into that space, it, it's a sort of visual shock, isn't it? It makes you see that space again, because mm -hmm. Who in Vermont is having that conversation? How are they having it? What is, why is it that Vermont remains so uniformly white? And you know, this has had an impact on our national conversation. Bernie Sanders is from Vermont. He has not registered the Black Lives Matter conversation. And, and frankly, that's why he's not the candidate now. And that to me is a shame, in all, you know, to put it very mildly. Uh, and so a photograph like this, does all that work? I mean, there's so much energy in this image here between Carl's thought and analysis and the graphic force of the letterpress that he's produced and the well thought out work by, um, by Karen Kaiser. She's, you know, this is, a, this is a smart piece of montage that she's done here. And she's done that thing of making her own whiteness visible to us in a way that I think the project as a whole calls for. And you begin then, I think, to see so much energy in the work that wouldn't be the same if we put it, although I have seen these posters in a gallery and they do do a certain kind of dramatic work there too, of course, but this is something extra. This is there's something very dramatic about this, and I, I absolutely agree with Karen. It was a brilliant hack by Lisa Martin to come up with this and to, to see the possibility there. And I'm just kind of slightly kicking myself, like, how did we not think of this before? Um, but it turns out that this is the perfect and the right moment for this. 
because of where we are now. And it kind of stunned me a moment ago when you said, well, this is only two years ago. It feels like an archaeological time period has unfolded, you know, 700 days? No, 700 years. I mean, it's such a such an intense time that we live through. And uh, so this this energy is going to continue. We have um, a meeting set up with a group of artists and activists in North Carolina. That's going to be uh, just in a few days now. Um, and I'm sure that we're going to continue to find lots of ways to, to use this work. I'm going to be doing some stuff with people in New York City. And I know that Lisa has already done that, but I want to take these works to monuments, uh, Columbus and Roosevelt and some other monuments and see how that looks. So there's going to be much energy. We're going to have to put up Karen's handle so we can all follow her on Instagram and know where the project is. Carl, will you speak just briefly about these posters that Maria selected? And did, was it, excuse me, Lisa selected? And was it Lisa who selected them? Or did you and Karen select them with Lisa? Well, actually, um, these are the two posters Nicholas and I pro uh, produced um, fr from the book. Mm -hmm. um, we went, we went to wanting 15 different quotes and 15 different posters to two posters. And so when Lisa uh, wanted to uh, use these posters, uh, um, the quotes, she wanted to do offset printing. And I said, well, no, let's just go ahead and do posters. And she produced both posters. And so that's um, how uh, the choices um uh, were made, so. I'm gonna go on to another image. This is still from the poster project um, with the women's darkroom. And this is in Murgate, yes. England, as you mentioned. Um, you know, I would, I would like Nicholas to talk a little bit about the history of Margate and why this particular image is so important. I know a little bit about the slave trade and Margate's right. role in the slave trade, but I think Nicholas uh, really knows quite a bit more and can yeah. give more nuance to it. I, I, well, thank you, Carl. I mean, that's kind of you. I, I'm not sure that's true, but nonetheless, I'll I'll, um, I'll chime in. So this is in this is where I'm from. This is uh, this is Margate in the UK on the southeast coast, and it's a step. We're looking at a statue by Anthony Gormley, who's a white British sculptor who's very well, well known in the UK. Uh, he has these kind of public sculptures all over the country. Um, and it, the statue is obviously standing in the water. It's about 100 yards out. Uh, and behind the statue, as it were, is an art gallery called Turner Contemporary, because the artist JMW Turner lived in Margate in the 18th and 19th centuries. And you can see from the sky, it's very Turner-esque, right? Uh, the other way around, it's Turner imitating the sky that he saw there. The sky is very large in Margate. And Turner would have been living there when he painted his famous Slavers, which is now in Boston, um, which is one of the most remarkable paintings to have come out of the Atlantic slave trade uh, and continues to generate insightful interpretation. I'm thinking of the African-American scholar Christina Sharp, who wrote beautifully about that painting just a couple of years ago, uh, and the poet Nusa Basie Philip, uh, who also wrote a poem called Zong uh, about, about the ship that's depicted sinking and throwing off Africans off the ship who are being jettisoned, which that's the word that comes into the English language to mean throwing property into the sea. And unfortunately, the, the Africans, 132 of them, were thrown from this ship in order to try and get them through the storm. And what I think the poster does when it attaches to the Gormley statue is to make those kinds of layered histories that are not apparent often in modern Europe visible. And Margate now is, as Carl mentioned earlier on, it's a town with a very active racist presence for a group called UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, 
There are pubs there where they hang the British flag in a way that makes it very clear that if you're not white, you should not go in there. And I grew up with spaces like that in the 1970s. There were places where it was clear you weren't welcome. And I hadn't seen that in the interim. And this to me then is what African-American scholar Kathleen McKittrick called folded time in a way the time folds now and we're in contact with the energy both of the 70s the negative energy of all that racism and that history of the Atlantic slave trade but also the history of abolition in this image that brings so many so much together in such a powerful way and Jane Howard who did this work she did a series of these photographs of the of the statue with the poster and also this very beautiful one of the poster on the sea, which is one of my favorites, because that's so expressive. And I think of the poet Derek Walcott and his statement, the sea is history. And all of that history literally flowing through that, that photograph. So I, I don't want to lecture here because that is my, my stock in trade and I will, I, I will go on for an hour or more if you let me hear. But this, it is just such an amazing, amazing work and it again it's that energy that's in Carl and Carl's work I mean perhaps the two of you could speak to this as twins you know that there's something so poetic about Carl's work that it doesn't surprise me in a way that his twin is a, a poet poet but the, the two of you dialogue in this very beautiful way to produce this kind of work right yeah I'm gonna just move us on to the next image and just because of time, I think that's a sort of beautiful place to jump. I selected this image. It brings us back to the States, brings us to my hometown, not far from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And this poster to me is another one of those, just like, is America the America I learned to imagine? Well, <laughs> no, it's not actually the America <laughs> I learned to imagine. And um, really, really powerful. Maybe the two of you want to speak a little bit about your collaboration and Carl, how you discovered, you know, kind of these great pearls of your sister and, um, and where you took them in. And if we can sort of jump our, our timeline a little bit, I want to move to the, the Bad Air Smells of Roses image so you can just, we can have that in the background as you speak. Um, I think I said a little bit uh, uh, earlier, um, it's, for me, it's about collaboration and it's about something that uh, Brian Eno talks about when he talks about uh, uh, we consider genius. Uh, when we think of genius, we think of one person in the studio expounding great truths when the reality is that it's a, it's a community effort where there is this one uh, where we a per, that one person that we consider a genius sitting in, in a uh, amongst a seat uh, uh, in a scene with a lot of people, creative people, a lot of creative things going on. And so, ever since I uh, at the beginning, I found the value in collaboration, the value in just sitting uh, amongst a lot of different voices, amongst a lot of different ideas. And to like value that instead of valuing my quote unquote authorship as an as an artist, and that's the spirit in which I uh, bring Karen into the conversation uh, of of our in our work. Um, Karen, you want to say something or? Well, I mean, you changed my life when you came over to eat and you came into the bedroom with me and you asked me about the writings under the, the dresser. You, I mean, I've had teachers say, oh, you're a good writer, but they never really took it beyond that. You were the one who said, hey, you have a gift. You're a poet. I had never heard that before. Mm. You're a poet and you're really good and I want to work with you. That changed my life. You know, I never considered, my, my background is math and science. I wanted to be a doctor. 
But here you come along and you were already established at that point to say, hey, this is how this is your speaking voice and this is how it works with my work. And let's let's do it. You know, I was thrilled. I initially was just uh, gave you the work and let you use it as you saw fit. But as time went on, I, I began to take more ownership to the point to where I'm at now, I really feel like we are this, we're in it together like this when we work. Even though we work individually, you ask me your question, I meditate on that, I use all the energies from what I've read and the images that I've seen to just let this energy come up and out. And I think that's that's really important in 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 a community work, uh, allow like Nicholas talks about, just sitting in the back of the room and listening to the wealth of knowledge, the wealth of experience, and to take that in and 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 and, and not use it as creative material, but see it as a community work of the voice of various people and to find some way to honor them in my in my work by allow allowing my work to be a a, a platform uh for for these in which these voices can speak so i mean that's what the poster project is you know all of these various voices from books from movies from from like all of these sources that signify blackness and various types of ways, whether they're emotions or uh, African-American culture or, um, uh, or a host of other things, you know, so. And Carl, this is, this is the poster project you're referring to that we're looking at, the Bad Air Smells of Roses. And this project you began in 2004, and it it's really acts as an ongoing dialogue, doesn't it? Yeah, it's actually a, a, a ongoing essay uh, using referential signs or references to to blackness in movies and in uh, uh, African American literature in politics uh, using uh, um, uh, letterpress uh, posters. And then I selected this image because it feels to me just so of this moment. Just feels like the moment we're living in. And this is actually a text that you created, Carl. Exactly. Uh, I, I did this particular poster in 2006 in response to what I was hearing in the talking points of the GLP at that time, you know, and I, I, uh, I just really felt like that is basically the uh, strategy that they use to control the language and the dialogue of, of any kind of issue. Now, that's particularly that their strategies and talking points have changed to just talking babble, so people won't ask questions. <laughs> to shut down the conversation instead of controlling it. But back then in 2006, this is, seems to be what it is that uh, they were doing back then. Um, so. yeah. There's so much to say. With just a little bit of time, Carl, I want to show this last sort of major work that's owned by the Whitney Museum. And, and have you just speak a little bit about this? Because I know for you, the, the work on the appearances or on the appearance of Black Lives Matter was sort of a bringing together of all of, of these. Exactly. Uh, this piece is called, oh, it's a, such a long title uh, off the top of my head. I yeah. for, forget some of the greatest some hits of the, greatest the, hits of the New York Police City Department. Police Department, a celebration of meritorious achievement in community service. And what it is, it's a, a history of police brutality of African-Americans from 1949 to 1994. Uh, and uh, the way it is constructed is that the award is given to the police officer for the police action beating or killing of an African-American. 
in the history of New York of New York City uh, between those periods. It's also uh, uh, the the piece is also uh, constructed uh, as also a history of trophy design because if the incident happened in 1949, I use trophies from that period to to illustrate it. So it it's 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 time based. In, in 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 terms of uh, trophy design as well as the history of police brutality. Such a powerful work. And you said to me, this isn't the the total installation. Uh, no, it, it it isn't. It's uh, this is the iteration of the trophy collection that was shown in 1993 uh, in uh, blackmail. Um, in the Black Male show, Black Male, um, I forget the name. That was another long title, I forgot. It was uh, actually 1994 uh, when this was first shown at the Whitney. This particular image was shown in a, a show uh, that was um, a, a year-long show from the collection of the Whitney Museum called uh, Incomplete History of Protest. So this uh, this is uh, the... Uh, reappearance of of this trophy collection from 1994. All right, I'm going to bring us back. There's there's just there's so much to say and I just want to thank all three of you for you know your work and your own collaboration because it starts to you know even in this conversation today show the dialogues that are possible and necessary in this time, right? The dialogue because I, as, as a person who identifies white in this country, am more white than I've ever been today. And, and mm -hmm. I am struggling with how to navigate that and how to negotiate what I believe in and, and what, how best to use my platform. And I appreciate, Nicholas, your work and your bravery to just kind of dive into this space. You said at one point in the preface that, that you inevitably failed and you just hope you can fail again bigger next time. I think fail better is the uh, fail it's better. the slogan that I take from Thomas uh, from Samuel Beckett uh, that he talks about fail better that you you're not going to succeed as an individual or even as a collaborative against the the odds that we're dealing with and there will never be a final victory there's never we're never going to achieve some utopia because utopia is a place that's dominated by religious or political authority in some way that we'll always have to renegotiate we have to think out a variety of demands and issues and that's what i think we're, we're beginning to see happening in a very interesting way right now there's a kind of intersectional conversation going on between different forms of ethnicity, indigenous folks, queer folks, trans folks, all of these demands are, are circulating. And it's in this moment where the whole society is on pause, you know, that we're, because so much of what happens is confused by the endless speed of modern America, the sheer craziness of the place. Uh, the pure products of America go crazy, if you remember. But when we slow down, oddly, we actually see things a little bit more clearly how they are. And I don't, want to, I don't want to leave us in a space of pessimism. I think we want to be in a space of realistic engagement with the challenges that there are, but also saying, you know, we have taken down many monuments. We have taken down the statues we have built. We are in the process of actually taking down the infrastructure of white supremacy. And that is a labor that will persist, sure, but we're a lot further down that road than we were when the book came out in 2018. And the fact that these projects are happening and that people are excited to participate in them and that many of these people are not of African descent, that they realize the, the call that's come from Carl and Karen's work. And you're feeling that, Kelly, and I think I'm feeling that. And I think the, the more of us that feel that and the more of us that engage working together like this, then let us not be pessimistic, but let us, let us fail better. Let us fail better. Donna, welcome back. We've almost 
Well, we've completely used up our hour, but I know you come to us with one last question. Hmm. Yes, well, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for a really amazing and thought-provoking conversation. Um, we haven't had any questions come through our, our chat at this time, so this is like a final opportunity for any audience members to post any questions. But um, in the meantime, I have a kind of, I guess it's kind of two-part question for Carl, Karen, and Nick. Um, and so, you know, thinking about, you know, we're going through a time of, institutional reckoning and arts institutions especially are having to face up to inequities in their histories and their staffing and their collecting practices etc so i'd like to ask you about your thoughts about this moment and also you know we work at an artist residency program which is part of an art center we're hosting 100 artists a year from all disciplines and geographical locations carl you were an artist fellow with us in 2006 and 2015 Nick, you're going to be joining us as a curatorial fellow next year. So also, I'd like to ask you, you know, thinking about the role that institutions can play in imagining a better, fairer world, what role do you think artist residencies have to play in this kind of moment of institutional reckoning and rethinking and retooling and thinking about different models, better models for living and working together? Yep. Uh, <laughs> Nick, I, I can't really speak to that. Carl and Nick are better. I'm, able here, to... I'm here. I was waiting on to, the, the actual artist might want to. Oh, to OK. I could talk to <laughs> uh, so, you know, my my history started with a uh, political activist in high school. Actually, I talked to her today, my high school photography teacher who taught that art could be a tool for social change. And, and in 1975, she talked about how uh, the media, how the media played a part in the success of the political activism against the Vietnam War. She said it wasn't the protests or the sit-ins, but the daily inundation of horrific images that changed public opinion about the war. And so mm -hmm. I think under COVID, we are experiencing the the same kind of thing is sort of this really radical reorientation of how we think about art from the precious object in the gallery uh, to something that circulates in the in culture that people can see and talk about and have, have dialogue about you know i think both are important but at this particular time i think the art that can get out there in public space has a much more of an immediate kind of uh, value, and that value acute, that value increases as it circulates and creates dialogue and importance. And I think that at uh, artist residency programs, any program that hasn't really been deeply affected. Uh, or in crisis because of COVID, have that opportunity to really be, uh, to, to move forward in a way, to, in, in some instances, take the place of, 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 of uh, the, the, some of these institutions that are uh, either uh, educational institutions or museums or, you know, and I think, uh, just me, I'm just a real big, big fan of Montavo, who uh, and Kelly, who uh, see the artist resi residency program as a professional laboratory, a creative laboratory for professional creative activity. I think that is a, a strategy that can really take uh, take a hold of uh, during this particular time. I think it. it I, there is an opportunity for uh, artist residency programs like Montavo to really be really those physical spaces in which a culture can be produced um, in a, a really vibrant kind of way. So. Thank you. Do you have any comments to the question, Nick? Sure. I mean, I, I second everything that Carl said, really. And I think it is 
we are in a transitional moment where things will not look the same on the other side of this moment than they did going into it. We still don't know what that other side looks like now. Those institutions that are still standing, and Carl is right to focus on that, I mean, a lot of places are going down, uh, have an opportunity to reorient themselves. And I think my shorthand way of saying that will be action oriented, outward facing. So that we had a thing called the art world and it was all glitz and big money and big shows and openings. And it's not going to be that. It's going to be, what does the work do to contribute to make change? Because we need that. I and mean, it doesn't matter. Well, of course it matters tremendously exactly what happens in November, but no matter what happens in November, that will not end. In fact, it will intensify no matter what happens on November 3rd, I, I guarantee you between November and January is going to be one of the most intense periods of our lives, whatever age we are. Mm -hmm. And we need to get ready. And so the places that have space and that have resources are remarkably important in helping people because most of the difficulty that community groups and social movements and action-oriented projects of all kinds, intellectual and political, have is finding space, having the resources, you know, a simple thing like printing a poster. We've, we have done a lot here. Somebody had to fund that. Somebody had to ship things, those kinds of, they're small things. But if you don't have that funding, then that doesn't happen. Uh, those kinds of conversations that need to have so that the ideas can be generated into those spaces finding the possibility to you know for people to carve out space in their lives so it's a remarkable opportunity for places that continue to have that possibility to say you know what let's look at this let's look at what our mission truly is and perhaps sometimes the people that established these places didn't have the motives that we would fully subscribe to now and we're going to have to do some examination of that too and then we'll find ourselves by looking back and looking forward into this interesting new triangulated space that will allow for a different kind of possibility i would hope yeah and karen do you want to make a closing any closing comments well, i can't tell you what a treat i've heard about you for so many years and to finally meet you in this space and I can't. Well, um, my hope for the future is the same hope that I have now, that my humanity and that the humanity of other Black people, Indigenous people, and all people of color, that our humanity is fully realized in the presence of whiteness. That's what the fight is all about. Thank you for that. And if that's our radical imaginary, we should be able to get there. Yeah. I want to thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. For being here and, and sharing this work and this conversation and keep us posted where it goes next. We want to share it far and wide. Um, and I look forward to when we can all share a bit of air together. Um, Donna, do you want to tell us about what comes next for Scratch Space? Yes, um, I would be delighted to do that. So um, next Thursday at the same time for Scratch Space, we're going to be joined by actor, multidisciplinary performing artist, writer and teaching artist, uh, Margaret Lorena Kemp. And she's going to be discussing her interest in embodied performance as a way of talking about and exploring the lived experience of race. Um, she's also going to be talking about her recent work during lockdown and introducing um, a virtual screening of Antigone Now, which is a contemporary response to a classical play, which was rehearsed and created collect collectively online between the US, Singapore, Japan and the UK using mobile phones, iPad and video, and it premiered in May 2020. So we'll be talking about how to model collaboration and research and community engagement through a digital platform and the challenges involved there. So it, it should be good and I'm excited and I hope that you can all join us uh, next week as we continue our Scratch Space series.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Yay.